Hi, everyone, and welcome to another exciting edition of Words, Images, and Worlds. So glad to be talking with author and illustrator Eugene Yelchin today on the podcast, on the show. Thank you. May, may I call you Eugene? Is that okay? Yes. Oh, yes, please. Of course. All right. Thank you. All right. Well, uh, thank you so much, Eugene, for jumping on and joining me for a brief chat today and uh, enjoy your work a great deal. So I'm glad to share about it. Thank you so much, Jason. I'm happy to be here with you. You are uh, your person that I think of as a creative force. I love the stories that you tell. I love the style that you bring uh, visually and as far as the, the verbal aspects of what you do. I don't know if you have a business card that says creative force, but I would <laughs> I would absolutely think that would be appropriate. Um, how did you get started on this journey of creativity and especially creativity for young people? Um. Well, first of all, thank you for saying those things. It's very, very kind of you. Um, uh, so much, so much depends, I think, on the formative years of ours. You know, what happens to us in the first, I don't know, six, ten years of our lives and where we are and the environment kind of forms us. And also now, I, I I truly believe that we carry uh, sort of memory of our family members as well. Mm -hmm. um, never thought of it before until I started started writing kind of personal narratives about about not really about myself, even though I'm present in them, but about the events kind of historical events that i happen to be a witness of um and i just realized how much of my personal reactions to to the events that occur today are tainted by by by, by my family members reactions and you know the, and the first time it occurred which was which was just uh, which was shocking to me, really, is when my 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 second kid was very little. My first, well, my first kid actually, my first kid was very little. He was just beginning to crawl, and I was really worried about him because we had like a staircase leading down uh, from the living room where he was crawling on the floor, and I and I started talking to him. And suddenly, I realized that it's not me talking; it's my mother. Mm -hmm. So my even my mother's voice, like her intonations were in my voice. And I just realized how um how dependent we are on what happened to our parents. Mm -hmm. And of course, what happened to my parents is uh, you know, where they were and the lives that they, you know, because I came from the USSR in 1983 when it was still the USSR, and uh, my family went through two wars a revolution a civil war and you name it you know mm -hmm. and the terror and red terror and stalin's there and purges and and all this on anti-semitism that was sort of on a state level there a different part different portions of our life so it's all like carry all of that stuff and i think all of that is is important for because i write for american children Mm -hmm. It's important for us to kind of understand, for them to 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 at least be aware of, so they don't take certain things that we have here for granted. So in a way, it's just I focus on children because I think, as I said, it's important. Those formative years are very important, but it's important for adults too. So many of us are just sort of assume that uh you know democracy is a given mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's yeah. not and it's not and we and 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 what is happening now which i obviously obsessed and you know watch day and night into languages is the war in ukraine mm -hmm. and, and and you know it doesn't matter what your political belief system is but but um it can happen anywhere at any yeah. time. 
Anyhow, it's a very long answer to your, <laughs> to your short question. I'm sorry. No, no, that's that's actually gets at another question that I had, which was how you go about sort of informing your work from that historical perspective. So um, that that gets right at something that I was going to ask you through the, the course of our talk and uh, absolutely spot on with thinking about reading as a way of building awareness of the world and both the world of the past, but the way that that world continues to come back and continues to the the themes that we treat on that continue to resurface uh, absolutely it's you are so right it's it, it's as if we are working with the same themes um for for since the beginning of literature really because we are essentially what there are two things at play in in my understanding one is the 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 world in which the event takes place mm -hmm. uh and 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 you as an actor or you as a uh or you as a as 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 a sort of identifier with the main character with the protagonist in the story you are reading right and 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 because we're trying to make our stories dramatic or at least i do um, very often the situation is where the humanity aspect of it kind of breaks down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the, the main question then becomes, how do I remain human, inhuman, under the inhuman condition? Mm -hmm. um, and that's, I think that's true about pretty much all of my, all of my work, apart from picture books, of course, for the very young. But middle grade and young adult, yes, that's that is, I think, the, how to remain human when when the world fall, falls apart, and mm -hmm. it doesn't have to it doesn't have to be the world as a, as a, our universe, the entire you know the entire planet or entire country or entire anything. It could be your relationship with one person. Mm -hmm. It could be your family. Very often, it is a, your family. Or in, in 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 my case, it's usually the country. When the country is that the or the state that you are part of is is in a place that does not value human life, how do you how do you go about? How do you, you know, how do you how do you remain honest? In, in under the condition where honesty can get you in trouble. And I think that's really important. And it's important even in our relationship with with each other, with every, with with other people, with members of our family, our friends, yeah. our classmates, you know, whatever it may be. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard that one of the rules of writing is to take a character that someone can relate to and then let bad things happen to them and then sort of see how they move forward from there. And if you're writing historically, that, that tends to not be too much of a leap to allow difficult circumstances to, to rise up around people and to then show a story where there's resilience that's part of that and character building. Yes, that this is. I totally agree with you. It's true, probably about about most of the most of the, uh, especially ch literature for 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 younger readers and also for adults. Well, there are two things that I, I I can mention in order in order for, and it's just purely pragmatic, mm -hmm. of horrific it sounds. In order for the reader to turn the pages, the author has to be somewhat of a sadist, you know, mm -hmm, you, mm -hmm. you, you are really sadistic to your protagonist. You really put them in one trouble after another that, that are connected by uh, causally, you know, by cause and effect. The best is when your character creates that trouble for your protagonist creates that trouble for himself or herself, themselves, whatever. There has to be some connection. And uh, unfortunately, the books that, uh, or fortunately, the books that tend to be page turners tend to end with cliffhangers on nearly every chapter. Um, and you almost have to have a talent at driving the story forward that way. Yeah, no, that's true. And and the, the, the danger, I think, is to become kind of formulaic because 
the formulas are there, you know, in as particularly in American publishing, as in American entertainment, mm -hmm. um, everything, every you can't do anything outside of a genre. Mm -hmm. uh, genre has to be identified instantly because it's much easier to sell, you know, and it, it's much clearer to pick a book off the shelf if you know what it's about in advance. Well, yes and no, right? I mean, you can be so formulaic that you know the that you know how it's going to come out mm -hmm. uh, from the first sentence. And there is some pleasure in it, you know, and some sort of, especially for younger readers, some some sense of control when you kind of, when you recognize the events and you recognize the tropes of a certain genre. And of course there is pleasure, yes, but um, but I'm not interested in that. Yeah. I'm, 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 I'm interested in something else uh, in, uh, in, in, I always feel like how wonderful it would be to create a piece of a piece of literature that and and, and it's not a fair comparison, but as a, as a game of sports, like so let's say soccer, for example, you know, in soccer, you have two teams and you have all the num you have all the numbers. You know who's good, who's bad, who's court moguls. You know everything, right? So mm -hmm. there should not be a, should not be a question who is going to win, except for you don't know, and yeah. you don't know from minute to minute. And if you can write like this, when you um, when you let the reader be in a constant stand of guessing. Mm -hmm. and, and usually, you know, in, in a typical sadistic way, you know, you break those expectations by the end of the chapter. It doesn't really have to be a cliffhanger. It doesn't really have to be um, any kind of like hooks. You know, there are all, all this terminology that's just really absurd. But mm -hmm. but but it's 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 there so people can understand each other, you know. But when you sit down and you start actually getting into the material, the only thing that's important is to create um, a, a state of crisis for your for your protagonist, mm -hmm. because that is the only way to find out your protagonist's character. Because our true character only comes out in crisis. You know, when we have food on the table and everything's fine, I mean, we're nice and everything's okay, we're all good. But the moment food disappears and, you know, you are under, you in an air raid and there's only so many, so many places in a bomb shelter, well, it's a different story, you know. Mm -hmm. Somebody said, uh, uh, I don't remember who said that, um, somebody said it's always interesting when, when death is in the room. Mm -hmm. And it, and it's mm -hmm. true, you know, when the stakes are high, yeah, of course, your attention instantly. But in terms of just, as you said, growth of a character, um, we can only really learn who we are when we're in a critical situation. Yeah, yeah. Well, and if you're thinking about a main character who's so often a hero, um, those are those moments where even something small can be heroic uh, and it doesn't have to be something that's grand and readers can relate to that too when there's a an action that a character takes that uh, seems insignificant but in the moment and in the context that it's in it's the most important thing they could do Absolutely, I completely agree with you. Yeah, the the, the scale, the scale, and the 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 level of conflict mm -hmm. is less important than um, than the predicament itself. How you find yourself in that the crisis can be tiny. It can be losing a friend or or you know saying something. I mean, where, okay, let's let's put it this way. Where do our sense of guilt really come in from? You know, if we ever feel guilty, it comes from our first memory of us doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, we never forget that. We either lie or we say or we do something that we didn't know any better at the moment. Yeah. But but it doesn't go away. It stays with us. 
And so I think that um, that could be tiny, literally tiny, mm -hmm. uh, uh, in view of the outcome of the event. You know, what happens as a result of the action, it's, it's essentially a, an... Um, a deed that cannot be undone. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think that's the best beginning of any book. Yeah. And so often that deed is, it's wrong because it hurts someone that we love, even in ways that we don't intend. Well, that's, that is exactly true, because because what what does it mean to be human is is to treat other people as humans, right? Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and so any story, regardless how simple or even simplistic it is, is always really sort of a moral argument. How, yeah. how do you live in the world without hurting other people? Yeah, yeah. And, and sometimes it's very difficult. On any, on any scale, on the big scale, on the tiny scale, on you know how you talk to your dog, even you know it's uh -huh. it's, it doesn't matter. But how do you remain human? That's that's I think the question. So as you're shaping your characters and your stories, um, what is it like? What what kind of process do you go through for bringing in some of the personal architecture that you have? You mentioned family when we started talking. Um, are are you a photo album? Uh, person are you uh, an, an internet ancestry uh, uh, individual yeah. no truly you know with my ancestor is all very tricky because the, the kind of history that they went through uh, tend to uh, erase their traces mm -hmm. I don't know my family past my um and I've never met them for obvious reasons. My great grandparents, I've never met them because they were, um, it's, they, you know, they, they perished and during the Holocaust, right? And my, my grandfather perished during the Stalinist purges and on and on and on. So, so the, and, and as a result of all of that, the, the fear, um, of the state of history of any changes because every change is always the change for the worst um where i came from as we now as we now as everyone now who's interested can see so so clearly right mm -hmm. um so nobody really talked very much about what happened silence was kind of the means of self-preservation and 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 protecting your children really so i can't quite rely on family history um that's why i don't write biography like autobiography uh, mm -hmm. but i but i do i wrote a memoir and i'm working on another one so where i rely exclusive exclusively on my memory and the, the, the only person I can really talk to is my brother, and very often who also lives near me, so so I can at least see him. Um, and this is the only two of us who are left. Uh, and often our memories about the same event are terrifically different, you know? Yeah. He, you saw it one way, I saw it another way. So it's it's a very interesting process. And memory is very interesting what it does to our to how we shape our stories. So to, to answer your question, I'm sorry, I I, I, I digressed. Um, there is really no formula to to create to to create a character and to create a story. Um, I, I know the structure of storytelling. I understand, I think, and I'm teaching it as well, you know, how to put together a, a sort of a Western version of a story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the truth is, is that you have to discover the, the you have to discover it. You can't you can't know it in advance. And right. so that is really fascinating process and it's magic. You know, at this point it's magic. And I feel if when I surprise myself, which doesn't happen very often, and it's incredible luck, when I surprise myself on a page, 
uh, I know that my readers will be surprised. And that's that's the goal, you know. If you come to this moment and you and you say to yourself, "Wow, really?" <laughs> then you know that they will do the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I'm just thinking how wonderful it is and how powerful it is that you're an author because talking about that story and talking about things from the past and ideas from the past that have been sort of held back and um, erased it's wonderful that you're creating those threads and exploring stories is, is a way of preserving history that way too yeah but i i you know thank you for saying it but i don't really do it for the sake of preservation mm -hmm. uh, you know uh past is past is gone mm -hmm. um but the future mm -hmm. is is unknown and so how do we as educators, you know, as, as, as authors, as librarians, as publishers, as editors, how do we, what's our role? You know, that's the big question. What are we here for? What do we do for our kids to prepare them for the future? Because we ourselves don't know it, right? Especially mm -hmm. now the future is so uncertain especially now our children growing up in a situation when nothing is given absolutely nothing is given uh they, they, there there is you know sort of this common in my in my mind's eye in my view misunderstanding that the free market uh allows for democracy well they, no not necessarily and we have we have examples of that. Uh, there is, I think, misunderstanding that things always get better. Not necessarily. Um, you know, the democracy is 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 still an experiment. It's very rare historically. Um, it actually never worked historically. United States is the first country that keeps 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 going you know but it's still very young so um, and it doesn't happen by itself it doesn't it, it's not just going to be here so so you know i suppose our work is to encourage our kids to uh to be aware of that that it's a very fragile concept and we have responsibility to um keep it going if that's what we believe in of course not everyone does Mm -hmm. uh, but if we do, if we believe in, you know, in 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 the pursuit of happiness and equality, you know, in freedom and all of those things, so they're all big words, but they sound like formulas now, but they're not. It's mm -hmm. it's all very real, very fragile, and it's a lot of work. Yeah, yeah, and that that speaks to the importance of how books and ideas bring people together and also just the, the utter importance of, of critical thinking and open conversations and dialogue that I feel like that's, that's a part of what books do and what your books can afford anyway. I think you're absolutely right. Exactly. I, I think the, 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 there's a wonderful quote from, Mm, this Russian 19th century, early 20th century, um, Russian uh, playwright and short story, short story writer Anton Chekhov. And I completely agree with it, and I try to do it in my work. He, he said that the, um, the the author does not give any answers. Mm -hmm. The author asks questions, and so. So in a way, some of my some of my better works they are um, open ended. I, I you know the 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 reader has to kind of decide for themselves. The readers mm -hmm. have to decide for themselves what's the right thing to do. You know how it's going to come out, and it could be very frustrating. And I know with this one book, Breaking Stalin's Nose, it's mm -hmm. very open ended. And I get letters all the time. Like, did he did he find his father? Did he at some point I got a letter from a school where the teacher told me that children hated the ending. 
And so I told them, we'll rewrite it. And mm -hmm. so they, they wrote, uh, you know, final chapter to, 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 to get those answers. I mean, it's funny and all, but it's also, it's also very powerful, you know, it's engaging. Yeah. So, um, so I think, yeah, there are many ways to make a book interesting. Um, it, and it's sort of not that hard. I guess what hard is to make the book sort of useful. Mm -hmm. And I think that's sort of the tragedy of an, of, a, of an artist to begin with is who needs us, you know? <laughs> who needs art, right? So Everybody. What you, what, <laughs> well, yeah, but, but not really, you know? It's not really, I wish, but no. No, I think in the past, you know, when, let's say if we talk about painters, when the painters were serving, you don't know, let's say, I don't know, Catholic Church, for example, right? When they were painted the crucifixion over and over and over and tried to figure out how to do it. So it moves you. So it's emotional. So it feels real. Well, they were getting paid for it and they felt like they're useful, right? Because they're doing something. Uh, but the, the the moment the artist painters, for example, became independent, well, that's that became a big a big problem uh, mm -hmm. for for people. Like, how do I feel useful? Yes, yeah. I'm making art. I'm enjoying it. It's pleasure. I I cannot not make art. But is it just for me? Is it like selfish? The reason I moved from painting to actually publishing. Because I've been, you know, I've been doing all kinds of things. Painting was one of them. Mm -hmm. I, I just, you know, I would, I would give everything I had into a painting, and it would take me several years to go over and over and back to the same painting. Um, and then it ends up in somebody's, you know, living room at best, or if it's sold to a color, big collector, um, in, in the storage. And I felt, and I felt that you know, and I worked in film, I worked in theater, I worked in different mediums. But then, like, I kind of like publishing because you, 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 you try to you speak to a lot of people at the same time. You know, mm -hmm. have a conversation with a lot of people, useful conversation. You, you hope for them. And you mentioned breaking Stalin's nose, and I was thinking about how if an ending is open that conversation continues and you, know, you you might read something that sort of wraps up with a nice bow and talk about some ideas from it but uh to inspire students and teachers to write you letters um that's that's a compliment in, in many ways i think because it means they're talking about it and it means that they cared enough about it to reach out and respond in some way uh, and I love your idea about well, write your own ending, and uh, you know why not write your own story for that matter? Well, that's true. That's true, and you know that's what you that's what one hopes to encourage is creativity, because creativity is when is when you are in solitude, mm -hmm. you know, when when you are when you are facing yourself. No. It's not like you, you know, you know, you're not fighting anybody, you're not trying to outdo anyone, but you're trying to kind of outdo yourself and you work against yourself. I think writing is an incredibly selfish process, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, because in a way you write to find out things about yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, what I can tell you what I do. I, I, I put myself into, into every protagonist I write. Because I don't know, I don't know how other people would create, uh, would 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 act in critical situations. Uh, so you know, any of my books, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, mm -hmm. it's all kind of me really reacting to historical events in one way or another. It's very limited, but that's kind of I feel like that's what I can do. You know, you can do everything. I can do I can do very little. Um, I love the 
the reader side of that too. And it's a, it's a quote that's often attributed to C.S. Lewis. I don't know if he actually said it or if a playwright said it that was writing about C.S. Lewis, but that idea that we read to know we're not alone. So someone takes the time to go on the, the pursuit of writing about themselves and writing about experiences that they have or imagine. And then they kind of send it out into the world and someone out there picks it up and responds to it in some way. That's uh, yeah. It's like a very long form letter in a way. Well, it is. It is. I think that's really fascinating subject, and we can talk for hours about that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it really is because well, a couple of things I just mentioned. One is, excuse me. One is, um, it's an act of recognition. Mm -hmm as you are reading something in a passage or a sentence or a word even or a situation, whatever it may be on the page, uh, you recognize as, as, um, as how you feel. Okay. You recognize okay. the feelings. And if you, and, 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 you know, some better writers um, writing in the past and, you know, just because of, <clears throat> circumstantially i grew up on kind of 19th century russian classic classical literature just because of my dad's library um you know T T tolstoy for example um he wrote the whole sort of critical book called what is art and in it he he speaks very clearly what it is you know whether it's a piece of music or any kind of piece of art when when an artist creates it the artist hopefully experiences certain certain emotion mm -hmm. right an emotional response to what he he or she or they they are creating and the the idea is to formalize it in such a way that when the the audience the reader or the listener or the viewer um comes upon that uh passage they feel the same feeling as you were feeling as you were creating it. Well, that's an incredibly difficult task, but if it's if it's honest, if it's if you you know if you're not trying to please anybody, mm -hmm. um, if you are if you are brave enough, courageous enough to tell the truth on the page, then yeah, they will absolutely feel the same. Agreed. Agreed. Well, we're coming down to our last couple of minutes on my, unfortunately, timed Zoom. I talk uh, to him. I talk no, to no, it's, it's great. It's a great <laughs> conversation. I, I love when uh, talks turn into... Uh, that when we actually get away from the questions that I had in mind and we, we talk about other things. So I appreciate that. Um, I, I appreciate your storytelling. We, we could we could go on. We could talk about how um, what you just said reminds me of Solzhenitsyn, uh, for example, and uh, some of those things. But um, I'll, I'll mention Genius Under the Table, Spy Runner, any any books, if someone's listening to this audio or video and, and they're thinking, I, I want to read something by this person, um, any that bubble to the surface is uh, sort of the direction you would point to maybe an introduction to your work or uh, something you're particularly proud of? Oh, um, well, what a <laughs> nice question. Thank you, Jason. I, mm -hmm. I, um, well, I think that there are, there are three books that for me for me they stand stand out in the past, and I hope that my new ones will not disappoint that I'm working on now. But um, one is Breaking Stalin's Nose. I'm very proud of that book. It created the most controversy yeah. um, in actually in the world because it was translated in ten languages and. When the Russian edition came out, it was, uh, I'm not going to go into that, but it was, a, it was a really event. It turned out to be the first book for children about Stalin. It's not been written before, which I had no idea. Um, I think that's an interesting book to, to, to take a look at for a number of reasons. The Genius Under the Table is just, it's too clear it's very close to it's who i am you know it's who my family was and and it's very dear to me mm -hmm. and the third one i think the um 
I, I kind of, you know, I, I'm sorry to say it. I think it's an exceptional book. It's, it's, it's a collaboration with M.T. Anderson on the uh, assassination of Brangwain Spurge. Um, Love that one, yeah. Love that. It, it, was, it was really fun to make, but it, it asks really big questions. He's a terrific, terrific person to work with. I mean, he is just he's a genius and i'm really proud that i had an opportunity to work with him and i think that book is extraordinary as far as as far as books go you know for kids mm -hmm. yeah. yeah but uh go ahead you you were talking about some works you have in progress yeah there are i'm working on three books right now one is a picture book which is written by david elliott for candlewick press uh, he's a lovely writer and i'm sure you know uh, his work he's a poet he's terrific and it's a very funny book so i'm illustrating it for 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 david and I'm working on um, sort of continuing. Well, it's not really continuation, but it's it's a it's a graphic memoir because uh -huh. uh, because my because original manuscript of uh, a genius under the table ended on a, a short chapter when you know I'm on a plane to the United States. And and uh, Elizabeth Bicknell from uh, Candlewick Press said, "No, no, no! I want the whole book about that." Mm -hmm. And so, um, and so that became becoming a, a graphic memoir of uh, of what happened in in the last three years of my life in Russia. And um, it's hell of a lot of work. It's it's I didn't know what I was taking on. <laughs> And and then there's another book that's just just at the very kind of beginning of its uh, uh, of the work. But yeah, things are kind of, things are coming, and it's really fun to uh, to be so busy. <laughs> that is, that is its own uh, benefit, yeah. And um, to your question earlier about do do people need artists? I, I think the at least the workload is suggesting. That that's the case um and i i've heard that graphic memoirs and graphic novels are quite a bit of work so um send sending lots of excitement for seeing that out in the world when it's ready thank you so much thank you i really appreciate this conversation you are a terrific interviewer oh, and, well, thank uh, you um i'm i'm very pleased that we were able to do this thank you so much jason yeah. thank you thank thanks for your wonderful and amazing work and thank you for being a terrific interviewee <laughs> thank you <laughs> all right all right thank you so much and i'll um i'll send the recordings back around to you that's great thank you so much jason have a great thank day you. you too all right bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.